Good evening, everyone, and welcome to MSU FCU's Financial Education Seminar Series. We appreciate you joining us, and we're excited to have you with us and bring our seminar series to you virtually. These presentations were created with you in mind with the intention to give financial education on a number of relatable topics to help expand your knowledge of finances. Each event will be hosted by a member of our financial education department or one of our partners connecting you with resources in our community. We have a number of diverse presentations planned for you this year, and you can explore and register for this year's events by visiting us at www.msufcu.org forward slash events. This evening's event is being recorded, so if you'd like to rewatch tonight's presentation, you're able to do so from our YouTube channel, or you can share the link with anyone who is unable to attend. We will have time after the presentation to address questions submitted to the chat, and this segment will not be recorded. You may send your inquiries at any time during the event, which will later be answered in the discussion portion in the order in which they were received. When sending messages, please be sure to address them to all panelists to ensure that it's properly directed. And once I've obtained your question, I'll reply to acknowledge I've successfully received it. Tonight, we're happy to bring you a presentation on raising financially educated children. So I will be your hostess for the evening. My name is Lindsay Morgan, and I have been part of the financial education department for a couple years now, been with the, the credit union for almost five. Uh, we're down to the last three days before that anniversary. Um, so very happy to be chatting with you this evening about raising financially aware children. Um, being a mother myself, I find this topic uh, very captivating. I am very passionate about it. Being a mother, um, I'm raising a five and a seven year old. So I just feel like this is incredibly important that we begin having these conversations at a young age. Um, so we can really start raising children that are thinking about some of these questions. And you might be thinking, well, really, is as young as possible? Sure, I challenge you to, you know, think that way because I, I think that sometimes we're not having these conversations. And that could be due to a number of reasons. It could be the way that we were raised. We were taught maybe to not talk about it or finances may have been something very personal in your culture or according to the way you were raised or what generation your parents or family members or guardians were. So there are a number of different factors that come into play. But again, I think the younger we can start having these conversations, mm -hmm. it's, it's going to create the ability for us to have more back and forth with our kids so that they can ask us questions, they can practice, and we can really help guide them. I think is the important part in shaping what their future is going to look like as it relates to finances. So thanks for joining me for this ride this evening as we explore a, a few different topics. Um, just to give you a, a little bit of insight, we're going to be talking also about how to make this fun, right? Because not all of us are educators, not all of us are teachers. Um, I think that that takes a special person in particular. And if I'm being honest, kids aren't always especially super excited to sit down and do more schoolwork at the end of the day after they just spent the entire day in a classroom setting. So I think the challenge here too is not only to make it as fun as possible, but as natural as possible to, to have these conversations so they can really see how these topics that we bring up are important, but also relevant in our day to day lives and how it's really going to end up setting them up for success. So why don't we go ahead and, and dive right into our presentation and to help us get in the right mind frame for today's topic. I want to ask you a couple of questions for reflection. So if you're joining us virtually tonight, I would like for you to, if you feel comfortable, share with me your answer in the chat. But if you are joining us from a recorded video, then again, please take a moment to 
get quiet with yourself. Think about how you would answer this question if you were in attendance this evening. And that question is, at what age should children begin learning about finances? What are your thoughts? And if I'm being honest, this is one of my favorite questions. Uh, I, I sometimes get asked being a financial educator when I tell people what my job is. They say, oh, so what do you do then? Who do you teach? And I let them know, yeah, we, we go out in the community and we teach anyone between young age groups from kindergarten all the way up to adulthood. And they say, wow, that's really expansive. And so what exactly do you teach a kindergartner or a first grader about finances? That has to be difficult. And I, I end up having a, a conversation with them that sometimes challenges the way that they think. But I want you to just reflect on this and decide how you feel about this question. Again, that being at what age should children, what age do you think they should begin learning about finances? Now, in the past, when I've asked my audience members uh, this question in particular, I've received a lot of responses uh, in relation to elementary school, sometimes middle school, right? But the overall trend has been it's at a relatively young age that everyone gives a response that's geared toward. So next, I want to ask you, how old was your child? when you began teaching them about financial literacy. Now, if you don't yet have children, or if, if you're not raising anyone yourself, right? Think about at what age was financial literacy brought up to you in your growing up stages of life? What age were you when you were taught about finances? Or what age have you heard of other parents or guardians or family members bringing this up to youth in their life. But again, if you're a parent or a guardian yourself, how old did you start teaching financial literacy or, or have you started? So when I gave this presentation last year, it was kind of a red flag moment for me because I, I was giving it and um, I said, oh yeah, I, I need to, work on that. I need to get on that boat. I, it was actually two years ago. Um, and over the summer, my daughter had received, we signed her up for a grasp packet, which if you're not aware of what that is, it's basically a summer learning packet that kids can work on. And it primarily covers mathematics, reading, uh, and also works on uh, some of their, their phonics skills, things like that. And in the math section, there were some questions about coins. And uh, my daughter came up to me and said, Mama, what is this? I don't know how to answer this. I haven't been taught that yet. And I said, oh my goodness. I was one of those people that was relying on the school system to start teaching my child this. And this is something that is administered. I'm not sure if it's throughout the entire state or throughout the nation, but they're asking my child questions related to this and as a former teacher and as a financial educator, I had this moment of, oh my gosh, I failed my child. Um, so I think it's really important, no matter how you might be having this realization yourself of, oh gosh, I'm behind the eight ball or, oh no, am I failing? No, you're definitely not. Again, me as a former educator and as a financial educator, I had a realization and it's better to have the realization and, and start somewhere than to not start at all. But again, I, I want you to have this in mind as we go throughout tonight's presentation to consider where are you at in these stages? Think about what age your child or your youth aged loved one, what age do they identify with? And what are some of the skills that you can maybe implement this evening to help get things started in what you perceive as the right direction. Because again, this is going to really help shape their financial well-being as they come into financial independence themselves. So just to speak to some of those common responses, right? We're not alone in our thinking that 
67% of parents feel like it's relevant to begin teaching their children about money between the ages of five and eight. So if you were thinking elementary school, early elementary school, absolutely, even depending upon your child and their readiness, this might even hit some of those pre-K years for you. And there are simple things that we can talk about. Again, if you're identifying as someone who is thinking, Lindsay, what do you teach a kindergartner or a, a preschooler? We're gonna talk about that tonight. Um, but also if you're thinking, oh gosh, I should have started this a long time ago. Again, you're not alone because most parents don't begin teaching their kids about finances until they're at least 15 years old. So again, it doesn't matter necessarily when you start. If you haven't started yet, if you're in that, that realization, the point is, is that you do start. Um, and, that, and I feel like you all care enough because you're all here this evening to try and learn what are some things that I can start implementing that are going to make it fun, that are gonna make it natural. It's not gonna stress me out. It's not gonna stress my child out or this person that I am raising and, and trying to shape. Um, so we're gonna go over a few, a few pointers tonight and I hope that you can take away some valuable skills at the end of this evening's presentation. So a few things that we're going to cover as we talk through the presentation tonight is going, the first thing we'll, we'll discuss are age appropriate concepts. So depending upon your child's age, depending upon, I think the other half of that is their personal readiness, right? You might start to implement some of the things that we talk about this evening, but we're going to kind of help narrow down some of these concepts by differentiating them by age. And then you can kind of tailor make that knowing your child best by um, their personal readiness, because every child is, is unique and grows at a different pace. Next, we're also going to implement into that conversation how to make that learning fun. It's not going to be great for you if you feel like you have to become a master of all of these different things. If I am pushing things on you as a financial educator, that's exhausting. And it's also not going to be fun for that young person you're trying to motivate. Um, again, our kids are in a classroom setting for about eight hours a day learning. And if they come home and they see you have a calculator and a budget worksheet and a notebook out, which I don't know, I mean, maybe, maybe some kids are super into that, uh, but not all kids are. So we're gonna talk about fun, easy ways to make this learning engaging and interactive. And then we'll also talk about our youth accounts at MSUFCU and some of the resources and ways that we really try to make having membership at MSUFCU fun and relevant for the kids that we service and the parents and make really make it make sense as they grow. So let's get started. The first age group that we're gonna talk about are really those pre-kindergarten and younger years. So, oh my goodness, yes, we're hitting those, those very early years. And again, it can be really hard to imagine that they could already begin to grasp financial literacy concepts. It's really important though, to start instilling these basics of finances since it will be, again, the foundation for their decision making in the future. This can be really easy to implement into your daily routines, making the learning conversational while asking your child to use some of these identification skills. So we're gonna start diving into some of those conversations that you can start having at these ages. One simple concept is to begin covering with your child the difference between needs and wants. Once you've defined what a need is, what a want is with your child, consider bringing up these differences during conversations. It doesn't have to be about money. It can be about food, grocery shopping, even how we use our time. And with some practice, they should be able to 
start differentiating between items they need to survive and what is simply for pure enjoyment. So, for example, when I have these conversations with my daughter, um, it's usually after dinner and she'll say, Mama, can I have an ice cream cone? And I'll, I'll say, okay, Eve, is that a need or a want? Because usually this question in the past, at least, it used to come at a really oddball time, like 4 p.m. And she'll say, well, it's something that I want. And then we have a conversation about how we haven't had dinner yet. And is dinner a need or a want? And you can kind of see or understand how that conversation might go from there. Um, same thing if my son asks, you know, can we go to the playground today? And I might say, uh, sure, but what are some other things that we have to do before we can go to the playground? Especially if one of those things might include making our bed or picking up our room. So then we start to, by having these easy conversations, identify what are things that we need to do? What are things that we want to do? What are things, foods that we need to have in order to grow and nurture ourselves? And what are things that we want to have that are simply um, filling our feel good cup, right? So again, as you're working through this with your child, if they answer incorrectly, ask them why they feel differently. This could lead you to have a, a better understanding of how they identify different things. And, and you never know, they might have some really good reasons. However, it also provides you that ability to have a, a teachable moment and redirect them if it's needed to explain that difference. And then you'll find as they begin to understand this concept, they might even begin to explain all on their own why they feel it's a need or a want. So my daughter might say, Mama, I'm, I'm really hungry. Um, are we going to have dinner soon? Because I know that that comes next and I know I'm going to want to have dessert. So I'm just wondering when we're going to start that, right? So you can start to hear that they are grasping these concepts, which is such a rewarding feeling as a parent. Now, a, another concept that is great to teach at a young age is goal setting. As you and your child are receiving money in, in their piggy bank, putting that in there, um, ask them what they would like to save their money for. You can then introduce the idea of goals and what it means to have a goal. You can explain that there are different kinds of goals, including personal goals, academic goals, and financial goals perhaps even others, depending upon your situation. So ask your child, what is a goal that you have and what do you think you'd like to save your money for? Would you like to do that with me? Invite them to do that with you. You can also explain if you're saving money for them, what that money is for and why you feel it's important. So for example, if uh, my child does chores and if I'm able to give them an allowance, I might say, we're, you know, we're gonna save half of this and we're gonna put it toward college because I feel like college is really important because if you decide someday you wanna be something that requires college, I want you to have the ability to go because my job as a parent is to keep you safe and, and support you and your hopes and your dreams. Um, and so that's a part of what I feel is me being a good mom. So having that conversation and explaining that to your child can help them learn or understand why it's important that you're saving for that in particular, let alone that amount. Um, and then also ask your child, you know, what are your saving goals? And maybe allow them to talk through a couple of their ideas. Now, if your child's struggling with the motivation to save, sometimes, again, you explaining why it's important, giving examples of when it can be important can start to help model those behaviors. And then they might start taking some of that on themselves. When you open your child a, a youth account, also consider naming one of their, their savings accounts or sub savers 
after a goal that they have in mind. So let's say we're saving 50% of their allowance for college and we're going to take the other, you know, 25, maybe 25% of that. Let's say they want a new bike. So we are going to name one of their sub savers at MSU FCU bike money. And this can really help that child to connect that money going into the account with that goal that they are saving for, which really helps to make saving more tangible and not so much of this, uh, this non-tangible, this non-physical uh, experience. They, they can't quite understand it. Um, so as you are, are going to the credit union, again, I invite you to make it a habit to take your child with you and when they're depositing that money, placing it in that sub saver, and then receiving that deposit slip that shows that was placed and seeing that balance going up, that's going to be really rewarding for them to know that they are getting closer and closer to their goal. If they understand the, the concept of a growing number yet, um, but it helps them to know that that money isn't just going away or vanishing into the abyss, that it is being placed somewhere and they can start to see how much they've saved. Now, as children grow a bit older, we start to expand on some of these concepts that they've started to master. And then we start to introduce some of those new ones. So for some of our aged five to eight content, one of the concepts that we aim to expand on is the understanding of needs versus wants uh, at your child's pace and introduce the idea of prioritization. So to help me with this, I like to have either one of my kids at this point help me in making our grocery list. And they think that this is really great because, oh my gosh, responsibility and they're helping. And it also helps me honestly review what I need to put on that list too. So once we have everything listed, I will have them decide what they think is a need and what they think is a want. And then we will rank those items by most important. So that really helps them to understand that not everything is a need, not everything that is a want. And if we absolutely needed to, let's say I didn't have enough money for everything on our list, or maybe I knowingly add a few things onto that list that, you know, there's there's no way we can pay for that in one shopping trip, right? Like a new car or a bike, for example, or a Nintendo Switch sort of thing. Um, so you can have that conversation to say, okay, what is most important? What's crucial that we get at the grocery store today? And they can start to realize, again, that there are a few things that we could live without or save up for or hold off on until we absolutely needed those items, right? So we can save that for a later day. And with time, that can really allow your child to know which items need to come first and which we could hold off on purchasing. Now, around kindergarten, we begin to name those coins and bills as we implement our money identification skills. As I told you, I had realized I had a gap in, in our family and doing those grass packets. So now whenever my child is interacting with money, I like to quiz her on what, what that bill, like some of the facts of who's this president, um, what number president were they, some cool things like that. And then with the coins, we might do the same thing, but primarily focusing on those denominations. So sometimes if she gets the answer right, how much is that, that coin worth? How much is a quarter, a dime, a nickel, and so on? I might give her another one and tell her she can keep those and add them to her piggy bank, which again, it makes that learning fun and engaging for them. She doesn't even realize that I'm actually trying to teach her something. This can also be done when you're giving your child money for allowance or for doing chores. If you're able to do that as a parent, have them talk through how much did you receive? You know, how much are these different coins worth? Great time to review that. 
And as they get older, you can practice their money counting skills. So before you go to the credit union to make a deposit, have your child count up how much money it is that they have. You can also have your child count out money whenever you're paying for an item in cash. So I, I might say, okay, we're going to pay for um, some fast food at McDonald's, right? And if I have cash with me and if there's no one behind me, that way they're not waiting painstakingly at the, the register, I might give my child a moment to count up how much money it is that we're going to then hand to the cashier. And this usually makes them feel really proud that they could do it. They also kind of feel like they paid, even though it was with your money, more than likely. But again, it's just instilling that positive relationship with money. Now, as children begin to act even more so with money, they begin to understand the value and the purpose behind using it. They eventually connect that money can be spent, saved, or shared, which also means given as a donation. So it can be a really great idea to talk to your children about what your family pays for, saves for, and what causes or organizations you donate to. This can tie together the link between prioritization and values as children get older. So consider asking your child, what would you wanna spend your money on? Or what would you save for? And who or what causes might you donate some of your money to when you get older? Now, obviously it's really important to at this, this age to remind children as we are wanting to give our money to others, we need to make sure that we have a conversation with an adult or parent or guardian first before they do that and ask for permission so they're not giving all of their money away. But it is really helpful, again, to have some of these conversations and maybe talk about how and how much or um, just some of the things that are included even in your family's budget or what some of the things are that you're saving for because they might start to look up to you or think maybe I should save for that too or maybe I would like to donate to that when I get older as well. Now, once your child's explain how they would use their money, you can expand on their saving goals, find fun ways to track their progress also with each one. Now, one way to do this could be to create a really cool visual aid, such as a thermometer or goal chart to kind of color in how far it is that they've come with their goal. So this can be a, a really fun and engaging way for kids to be able to do that, as you kind of see here toward the right of the screen, where they can kind of color that in. It gets them engaged with saving. Um, it gets them excited about it, almost like a countdown. If you think about it for the holidays, sometimes kids will do things similar to this, um, but it, it kind of helps track that progress, which is such a rewarding experience. And really most of them have a lot of fun coloring in that chart, watching them get closer to that achievement. And it can also really help them feel like they're making progress when saving can be still so figurative, even at those ages. Now, once children have a good understanding of needs versus wants, and they can correctly identify and count money, um, and they're starting to really focus on save, spend, give, then we start to introduce some other practices as they move into those nine to 12 years of age, um, age groups. So if your child has a good understanding of counting and basic math, encourage your child to begin making change. So one way to allow them to practice these skills in everyday life is to have them literally pay for different items. So allow your child to add up how much cash they're gonna need in order to pay for their purchases and ask them to anticipate how much change do they think they're gonna receive based upon how much they handed the cashier. So we're kind of focusing on those addition skills and then also some of those subtraction skills as well um, and what coins they might receive back and going through all of the different groups that they might receive in return. Now, at this point, you should also see your child begin to understand the cost of different items. You can help your child realize this by expanding um, 
on their assistance when making that grocery list. So heading back to that idea, as you make that grocery list together, ask your child after we've identified needs, wants, prioritize that list, ask them to take a guess for how much they think each item is worth. Then when you go to the grocery store, have them write down the correct price of each item to familiarize them with how much things actually cost, kind of like a price is right moment and makes it really fun, but it's a learning opportunity for them to realize, wow, maybe life is a little expensive. Oh, so when mom or dad or this family member is talking to me about this, maybe I should start paying attention because we start to see some appreciation at these ages as they come to these realizations. As their math skills improve, you can also ask your child to keep a running total of all of those items that you put into the grocery cart while you shop. And this can really help them to understand how much groceries overall cost. They can compare also that to your family's budget for the month. So if you're comfortable, Again, sharing this, this can be a really great opportunity to discuss with them the family budget, how you maintain it, and how much your family spends on different items. So I might say to my child, I keep our budget in an Excel spreadsheet, and these are some of the things that I include. And if I'm not comfortable sharing how much it is that my family spends on groceries month to month, maybe I say, People typically spend, if they're living on their own, this amount of money. If it's a family of, of four or five or however many might be, this is how much they typically spend, just to give them some ideas. Um, it, it's also going to help to start having these conversations sooner than later. That way, when they start keeping a budget themselves, they know how much might be some realistic amounts to include in that budget or what are some budgeting platforms that I could use to be successful with responsibly spending my money? Around this age, you can also consider having your child take on more responsibility with managing their own savings account. Take opportunities to review with your child their savings account statement, review balances, and really teach them how deposits and withdrawals impact their balance. This can also be a great time to talk to them about the consequences of overdrawing your account, discuss what overdraft fees are, and the financial consequences. When you visit the credit union, you can ask your child to track their balance for the, that savings account in which they're making deposits and withdrawals. And then when that statement arrives, Using the on, or online banking through a computer line or mobile app, have your child compare their calculated balance to their account balance to see how they did. You can have them review and track their progress toward their saving goals themselves as they earn money from their allowance, chores, or other life events. So again, this is really a great way to start teaching them using age appropriate concepts, but some of that money responsibility and a, a great time to help remind you is whenever you're sitting down to review your family's budget or reviewing expenses for the month or that pay period, take an extra few minutes to do the same thing with your child to help make it more of a habit. Now, as your child gets a little bit older, they reach an age where they can join the workforce. So we're talking about ages 13 to 15. Now, according to Michigan.gov, a minor must be at least 14 years old in order to be hired by an employer in the state of Michigan. However, prior to that, your child might be earning extra funds by dog walking, landscaping, babysitting, assisting with small jobs around the house, you name it. And as your child begins to earn their own money, their relationship with it is going to change. When they begin to earn their own money, consider allowing your child the ability to start managing it more. You can help them make guided decisions for how they save, spend, and share it. Um, and this hands-on approach can really allow you to talk to your child about their ideas and give you an opportunity to point out things too that they may not have considered. This can also be the perfect time to allow your child to begin operating their own budget 
after having those money conversations. Now, again, the whole idea surrounding this is using this hands-on approach and really guiding them. They might say, oh, well, I wanna save, you know, 25% of my money for um, college or trade school or getting a certification, whatever that looks like for them and what their goals are. And then maybe I wanna spend, you know, 75% of it going out with friends. That'd be a great opportunity to maybe have a guided conversation about let's let's maybe rework some of those percentages and let's talk about why and let's maybe also talk about establishing an emergency savings that way if something comes up when you get older you you have essentially a rainy day fund right um and and again hopefully that's going to help them to establish some of those good habits before they come have or requ are required to be completely self-sufficient and have those real life consequences take place. So it's a really great time for you to be that safety net as they talk through what they would do. You can redirect them and hopefully help create and instill some of those good habits. Now, once kids start earning their own money, they're soon going to realize how quickly it can be spent. So to help your child learn how to stretch their dollars a little bit further, consider teaching them about comparison shopping. So when you go to the store, try having your child tell you which items are the better deals and talk about shopping across different brands. You can also talk about comparison shopping and point out how to figure out the unit price of an item and then expand to have that discussion about quantity over quality and vice versa. So for example, of course, Fruitios might be the better deal, but does your family really just enjoy a good Fruit Loop and <laughs> you are willing to spend the extra dollar on that box of Fruit Loops because they just hold that crunch a little better and they're just that much sweeter, right? So it's also a great time to teach your kids about what do we value? What are we willing to spend a little bit of extra money on and what isn't as important to us and how that is unique person to person. Also, we can talk about how the cheapest item may not always be the best, um, although it's saving us money. Maybe it is more um, well-made than an item that we might find at a, a cheaper, more, Cost effective store, if you will. Um, so, again, it's really important to talk to them about weighing out those difference, tying in their values to that, and also the importance of really doing your research. And that can, that we can then bring into that conversation um, how we can use the internet to look up reviews and using reputable websites as we're researching different items and being aware of sponsored ads or sponsored reviews and paid reviews. Um, you can also talk about how that influences your spending as an adult and um, what things you look out for and are aware of. And then that could even tie in a conversation about um, being aware of fraud and avoiding fraud and being aware of scams and really just kind of introducing that idea of something seems too good to be true, probably is. Um, we can also talk about sales and how if something is on sale, is it truly on sale or are they just, were they marking the price up previously to make it or, or offering some sort of coupon to say, oh, now you're getting this great deal where really that's just the cost of the item that you could find at any other store. It's just making it look like it's on sale. Um, or is there a better time of year to buy something? Should we maybe hold off on this new video game and wait until the demand has lowered and the supply has increased so that we start to see those prices go down, right? So a little, little economics conversation in there that they may not even recognize that you're having. So all very natural, easy ways that we can kind of be talking about this without even real, the, the child not even realize that they are learning very valuable information. Now, the longer your child works, the more they'll begin to comprehend that relationship between time and money. 
So this is a great opportunity to discuss fair wages as they search for employment and compare jobs. And it's never too late to ask that age old question of what do you wanna be when you grow up? Based upon their answer, consider expo expanding that conversation to include um, how much schooling your child might need for that job, or is, there, is it a trade school that they have to go to, or do they have to earn certifications or licenses to do what they wanna do? Um, what is the cost of that education going to look like? At that point in time, you could also have a conversation with them to say what your family's plan is for financing their education or not, depending upon your situation and what they can expect to start making in their chosen field of, of study um, and what they can do to prepare. So is this a great time to start organizing some job shadows for them or start working on a resume as they're applying for some of their first jobs or, or second jobs um, and learning how to apply for financial aid if that's the route that they're taking. So a lot of really great conversations, not um, things that maybe we've all had conversations about, but it's important, I think at this age in particular to start talking about, is there a plan? To, to help assist financially with your future, or are you kind of on your own? Because I think they need to be aware as they start saving their money, what are they saving it for? And that, is that something that they need to prioritize or financial aid? What does that mean? And how does that save them money? And uh, we, then we start talking about scholarships and grants, which are all really wonderful things that we address in other seminar series events and things like that. So stay tuned for more information. Now, as we enter into our teens, or late teens in particular, it's really only a matter of time before they're out on their own, potentially financially independent. And still there's a whole lot more learning ahead of them when it comes to managing their finances. So at this point, your child will likely be managing their own savings account to achieve their financial goals and possibly their checking at this point too. As they work to operate their own checking, it's really important that they have familiarity with how to write a check and, and also using money orders and cashier's checks as well. So the next time you make a purchase, consider writing a check for that purchase if applicable, or you could even practice how to write out a check at home Maybe find a check writing template online, print that out for them. And the next time you pay, for example, your utility bill or your rent, have them practice writing that out with you. Obviously theirs is, is just a printed out paper template, not gonna go anywhere. However, this is a great opportunity for them to learn how that is accomplished and it gives them that practice that, that they need to feel uh, confident in doing that moving forward. Now you can explain to them that although checks aren't commonly used anymore, you might still need to write them to pay for daycare, utility bills, rent, taxes. Um, there's also extra added security that comes with using money orders or cashier's checks. So that's another talking point. And this could also be required for their security deposit for their first apartment or even used to pay for their college tuition. So. Although um, checks, cashier's checks, money orders, they may not be as commonly used as what they once were, still definitely a valuable conversation to have. Now your child may also be very comfortable with managing their own account and might be customizing it with multiple saving accounts depending upon those goals they have. As they develop their goals, consider asking them what they're saving for and when they'd like to have that goal achieved. Developing a timeline and appropriate goals can be the perfect opportunity to discuss with them how to set up automatic transfers to keep them on track with achieving those goals and different account types available to them. So discussing those dividend earning accounts, such as IMMAs, certificates, all of that's a really great introduction truly to investing and earning dividends. You can try some guided practice by talking through some different goals and what might be the best account type for each. So, for example, if we're saving up for a car and maybe we're 17 years old and we want to have purchased a car within the next six months, 
um, perhaps opening a six month certificate is the best way to go because we know we're not going to need that money for that period of time. Um, and it's really going to help expedite where it is financially we have to go. However, maybe we just have an emergency savings account it has a, a pretty decent balance in it, maybe, I don't know, $5,000 so far. Okay. Um, and you, they're just kind of needing something that they can constantly keep adding to, um, but they need to be able to have the ability to withdraw from it should they need to as well, but there's a healthy balance in there. Um, so maybe an IMMA is best for them, right? So just talking through some of these different kinds of scenarios can really get them comfortable with what dividend earning accounts are and when they're best utilized. Remind your child too, as they are setting up transfers for these different account types to make sure that they're adding those things into their budget to always keep their accounts in good standing. So that is gonna be something really important as you're going through that guided practice with them to remind them of. Um, and this is, this is a great thing to learn before they enter adulthood. Um, because again, in those situations, we've got real life consequences going on and why not talk through these things when you can be there as their safety net. It's also really important that your teen understand the difference between debit and credit card purchases, how credit cards work and the importance of credit. You'd be surprised how many myths your child has heard about credit. Uh, so having that ability to inform them of what's fact, what's fiction is going to be really helpful. Now, one great way to help educate them is to have them use a line of credit, such as our youth credit card. You can explain to them that carrying a balance month to month, it accrues interest. It's that fee for having borrowed money. But if they charge to that card small purchases, keep that balance at 30% or less. Um, and pay that balance off every single month, which is what we call that statement balance. It allows them to avoid paying interest altogether while building their credit. So if they can understand um, that piece, it's really gonna model for them that credit is to be used solely, uh, a credit card is to be used solely as a tool for building credit uh, while for building that credit score while establishing credit in their name. So that's going to prepare them for when they would like to perhaps get a cell phone bill on their name or rent their first apartment. They'll already have credit established. Um, they'll already have the score to that reflects that. Um, but more importantly, they'll have that financial education to know this is how a credit card should be used. That way, when I have to get a loan for something that requires I pay interest, now I've qualified myself with having a great credit score for the lowest interest rate options available with my credit union. So again, some really great pieces to talk to with our kids when they're in this age group. Now, when your child is earning their paycheck, it's really a great time to review with them their pay stub. And a lot of people don't even see their pay stub now that everything's recorded online, but it's really important to teach them what's coming out of their check. So be sure to discuss with them the difference between net pay, gross pay, taxes, and payments to Social Security and Medicaid, and why those are important and when they're going to come into play in future years. Even if your teen isn't currently contributing, it's also important to discuss the value of health insurance and retirement accounts, both of which may also in the future be deducted from their paycheck. And when your child gets their first job, take a moment to sit down and review that pay stub and discuss, you know, how do you want to be paid moving forward? Are we going to set up direct deposit? How do you set up direct deposit? What information do you need? And we're always happy to help you at the credit union too. If if there's anything that you need help with, or if you need assistance obtaining the credit union's routing number and your account number. Um, but it's a really great time to, to discuss, okay, now that we have money regularly coming in, can we start setting up some automatic transfers to savings to ensure that we're always paying ourselves first? Um, maybe we need to set up auto payment for our youth visa. 
And it's always good to discuss too how to manually transfer money between accounts just in the event that you know we feel that an automatic transfer may not be necessary. Again, with a little bit of practice, your child should start to feel fairly confident about becoming financially independent is really, I think, where we want them as parents and as guardians and trying to support them and get them off on the right financial footing. So if you're someone who it's like, wow, Lindsay, this is really great information, but when we were talking about dividend earning accounts, I was, I'm gonna be honest, I was a little lost or, okay, that's great about credit, but I never received that growing up. So how can I successfully have a conversation with my child about credit if I don't have a very great awareness myself? Well, look no further. We at the credit union have created Financial 4.0 and that is a resource. It was created primarily for high school and um, college bound students, students who are currently in college. But I invite everyone to take a look at it because we have different content categories related to budgeting and credit, investing basics, um, paying for school, all sorts of different things, even lifestyle and travel if you need a brain break. And it really helps you in reading these weekly articles, infographics, watching some of these videos and expanding on your financial education, especially if you feel like you have leaks yourself or if your, your child might have some learning gaps in there too. So it, it makes it fun, it keeps it light. We have really fun quizzes that you can take. Um, um, contests, things like that, that you can enter into. So it, it keeps it engaging is 100% the most important thing. So if you're interested, feel free to check out our website by going to msufcu.org forward slash FIN40, F-I-N-4-0, or you can search for the app um, using your app store, searching financial 4.0 for MSU. So we're now going to start talking about our youth accounts as we begin to close out our presentation this evening. So, um, and, and talk about how that's relevant per age group and, and really built to assist parents in their journey to uh, making or supporting financially aware children. So our youth accounts really aim to give our younger members those opportunities for financial education and really also aim to establish a relationship with the credit union. They're a really great way to educate your kid on how to handle their own finances and their accounts. So with your account opening, you have access to contests, promotions. You're gonna be invited to the credit union's kids day. You'll receive newsletters, activity sheets, birthday cards. It's really fun and an, a super exciting time in your child's life when they start to receive some of these flyers and things coming through. Um, they also have access to our online youth store where for every $10 deposited to their account, they earn a virtual coin, which can later be used to purchase an item from our youth store and computer line. So some really fun, engaging things there. Each account though is really structured to help you and your child achieve financial goals and to keep you on track with your child's financial education milestones. Now, in order to open an account, your child's going to need to have a legal parent or guardian on that account with them. And we'll need the child's social security number as well. No birth certificate is required if you were wondering. Now, if you're opening an account for a child age zero to two, they're going to qualify for a sweet pea account. If your child's between the ages of three and six, they'll have a dollar dog account. As your child grows, the account will automatically upgrade to or update to the next account level. And kids are always super excited to see that their accounts have progressed to those new stages. With both Sweet Pea and Dollar Dog accounts, you and your child are going to have access to certificates to encourage them to begin establishing some of those saving habits. Our one year add on certificate is particularly popular amongst parents and guardians since you only need $50 to open them and you can contribute up to $10,000 to it throughout the year unlike other certificates and dividend earning accounts. Having an account at the credit union also grants you access to our Coverdell Education Saving Accounts, or CESAs. CESAs allow individuals to save money for their child's education. 
Contributions are non-deductible, but do feature a tax-free, penalty-free withdrawal for certain educational expenses before the beneficiary reaches the age of 30. Funds from the CESA are typically, again, used for educational expenses. So that could include books, tuition, um, college or on-campus housing, all that are for college, uh, private schooling. It can even um, be used from the elementary school ages all the way up through college. So you can contribute about $2,000 maximum per year until your child is 18 years of age and the funds must be used by the time they reach 30 years old. Now, if they've not used those funds, they can be transferred to a different minor who is under the age of 30, right? Minor is the key word there. Or the child can withdraw the funds and pay the taxes and penalties on those earnings. It's also important to note that each child can only have one CESA account. With your account at MSUFCU, your child also gains access to our fun and free gaming apps that were created to help expand your child's financial literacy. All of our apps can be accessed through Google Play or the Apple Store. Now, for young children, ages two to five, we recommend our Saving with Piggy app. This app teaches children core concepts with coins and values of each denomination. The game features four levels that increase in difficulty and adds additional concepts. And the levels begin with identifying coins and then grow to teach children about coin values. So my kids 100% absolutely love this game. They're five and seven right now, and we will be waiting in the doctor's office and waiting room and they'll say, mama, or waiting for our food at dinner, right? If we've gone out to eat and they'll say, mama, can I play the piggy game is what they call it. It's so cute. And they have really, that's been honestly my, one of my primary modes of teaching them um, about their coin values and denominations. And now my daughter is kind of a leader in her class, helping her classmates learn about the different denominations and what those add up to. So thanks, Saving with Piggy. Um, now, if your child is a little bit older, they have some other opportunities available to them. I apologize, my PowerPoint's not responding. There we go. Um, and when they turn, to age seven, their account will automatically convert to a CyberSaver account. And they're going to continue to have access to those same like certificates, CESAs, and our free gaming apps, but they're now encouraged to download and use the mobile app and create their own computer line or app login to allow them to begin managing their own savings account. They can also explore how to pay with a card and maintain a balance with the offer of a prepaid visa which can be a really nice initial step since the balance uses a predetermined amount. So kind of like how back in the day, I don't know if they still have them anymore, you could just get like those pay-as-you-go phones, right? This is kind of like you load up that, that um, free amount, if you will. It's like a, that prepaid visa, right? So you're good there. No, no concerns about going over things like that. Once your child is 11, their account will change to a money club account. This account offers all of the previous features that we previously discussed, um, but they can now sign up for e-alerts to help them with maintaining their account balance. They can open up a checking account with a debit card and really having that checking account to give to your child helps them to practice keeping some of their saving goals and saving account money separate from their checking account money or their spending money and also allows them to learn how to keep an eye on those balances while using their debit card. Now, if this feels like a lot, don't forget all of these milestones are simply suggestions. We're going to grant that child the ability to do so, but it's still up to you as a parent um, what your child is ready for. Because again, we recognize that Every child is unique. They grow at different rates, which is why using all of these features is completely optional. But if you have questions, apprehensions, 
please feel free to reach out to us to discuss your concerns with an MSU FCU representative so we can talk about some of the options that exist. Now to keep your child engaged with their financial education, again, we continue to offer those age appropriate free financial literacy apps. So Saving Draggy is recommended for youth ages five to 10 and teaches core concepts of earning, saving and strategic planning. In this game, children attempt to save a baby dragon named Draggy by visiting different stores and locations where they're challenged with money decisions. Saving Magic is recommended for children aged five to 13 and teaches them about dividend earning accounts while saving to purchase items in the future. So in this magical world, dragons are stealing magic from the world and it's up to the player to stop them. Children climb ancient towers, free the magic back into the world by earning, saving, and spending money wisely. Coins they save accrue interest even when they're not playing, allowing them to experience a sense of dividend earning. So that's really cool. Something that I think most kids don't even get to kind of interface with at such a young age. So how awesome is that? Now, once your child turns 14, their account converts to a CU Succeed account. Once they turn 15, they're eligible for a youth visa card. Our youth visas offer a great opportunity for teens to get an idea of how credit works and build their credit using a real credit card. These cards have a maximum limit of $500, and you can choose from either our low rate platinum visa or our 1% cash back earning platinum plus visa. Youth visas do require a co-borrower and the rate is determined using the co-borrower score. Once the teen turns 18, they can then apply to have the co-borrower removed and to have their limit increased. Now, we also offer a free app for our teens called Dream Racer. And this game is recommended for anyone really age 10 to 17, and it teaches those core concepts of saving, budgeting, and managing those monthly payments, which is kind of right where they might be at that age. The player begins the game with money and savings, but needing to upgrade their race car with the help of a loan. Sounds like it could be pretty relevant. Throughout the game, the player must take their uh, monthly payments and manage them along with other expenses, helping them to race to the front of the line. So again, the fun continues. You might notice that some of our, our uh, apps, the recommended age overlaps, but again, it's just speaking mm -hmm. to where your child is uniquely at, their, their progress um, as an individual, and also speaks to their interest because some kids might think saving with Peggy is, is really fantastic. Some kids might need, you know, saving with Draggy or saving magic to entertain them a little bit more. So find what works best for your child. Now I want to kind of close out our presentation tonight with a few reminders, things to keep top of mind, right? The first thing being, it's really okay to ask for help. Again, not all of us are natural born educators, and many of us are still learning ourselves. It's even okay if you don't have all of the answers, research and learn together. This can really also set a healthy example for your child, you doing this, and teach them to take initiative when it comes to learning and teaching them also how to invest in themselves. Um, also, another tip is to just explore the free resources that exist. There are plenty of those available to you. You can check out programming through your, your community, your library, see what they offer, check out what your school system is doing to teach financial literacy and see if you can implement any of that at home um, and explore credit union resources like Financial 4.0 or even our free apps that we talked about tonight. Many community groups also invite the credit union to partner with them and extend financial literacy to their participants. So if you belong to a certain community group, ask if they partner with MSUFCU and our financial education programming, 
or see if we're we're partnered and working in your schools and um you know that that could be an extra added resource for you to partake in as well also involve others in the learning process we've all heard of the phase it takes a village and this is also true when it comes to financial literacy and not a single one of us has all of the answers. So if you don't know the answer to something that your child is really interested in learning about, find them a reputable resource to ask their questions to. And if they're, for example, interested in investing, hook them up with a financial advisor to toss ideas out with. And if they're interested in credit or budgeting, have them attend one of our financial education programs or speak with a financial educator after that session. Many people are happy to help and you can also learn right alongside them if you're unsure. Now, it's, it's also, I want to make this point too. It's never too late to start. Some financial education is definitely better than none at all. I know I totally was not given all of the answers when I was young, but it's important that you do what you can with the time that you have and then provide your child with those resources to continue. Uh, to invest in themselves. In those situations, something is definitely better than nothing, and your child is likely going to appreciate you for recognizing those gaps and making overcoming that a priority. Finally, I want to remind us to just make learning fun. Find a way to use those real life scenarios or moments in everyday interactions as teaching opportunities. The more hands on you can make having these conversations, the more your child is going to grasp and connect some of these contact or concepts. And this will also help them to understand some of those consequences of their decisions too. And it's really going to make it feel a lot less like homework for you and them and allow for a lot more fun, enjoyment, and some of those aha moments to take place. So I just want to close out and saying thank you everyone so much for joining us this evening. I'm going to close out by mentioning a few extra resources or things that you can partake in as a member of MSUFCU. Um, we've already touched on Financial 4.0, but if you're thirsty for more education, check out our free podcast. It's available wherever you get your podcasts. And Wallet Watch, those hosts interviews, interview industry experts. Um, we also have a business highlight uh, every season where we will interview a small business mm -hmm. owner and, and talk about entrepreneurial concepts. So uh, another re great resource for you to check out. Um, I'll remind you, if you are a credit or debit card holder at the credit union, check out local loyalty. Um, if a business in your community is partnered under our local loyalty program, when you shop there, you can receive discounts on what you're buying by using your MSUFCU debit or credit card. So it's a great way for us to be able to support our small business owners and business owners in the area and also be able to provide you with that little bit of extra money in your budget by saving you some hard earned funds. Now, if you like what you've heard this evening, and if you would like to donate to our, um, our charitable fund, if you will, the dust drawer fund, feel free to reach out to us. Um, you can make a donation toward arts and culture, stable housing, empowering youth, financial education, or fostering entrepreneurialism. And we want to remind you that any of those donations are tax deductible. So we're now going to stop recording and address any questions submitted to the chat. We are going to answer those in the order in which we received them. And as a reminder, please be sure to address your questions to all panelists. For those of you not staying for the discussion portion of our event, I invite you to take the survey that's gonna automatically open at the close of our presentation so we can consider your feedback and please don't forget to join us for some of our upcoming seminar series events. Um, we have one next week, Wednesday, um, that is titled Preparing for Home Ownership. Um, so that'll take place on January 11th at our Auburn Hills Regional Office location. So we hope to see you there. And we will also be talking about some of those pending provisions for tax filing in 2023. 
which takes place on Thursday, January 19th. So that one will be hosted virtually. If you're able to attend, again, we hope that you'll join us. So thank you everyone for being here this evening. We're now going to stop the recording and open it up for the chat.